Hi everybody, this is Marlene with Erie News and today is Thursday, June 13th, 2024. June 13th, 2024. And let's start off like we always do with uh, Stranger Than Fiction stories. Now, our first story is titled Perdition at Lake, Lake Poyang. Poyang Lake is a large 1,400 square mile body of water in China's Jiangxi province. The lake was formed around 400 AD when the Gan River backed up and the flood swallowed the countryside, sending people fleeing for their lives. Was this ravenous hunger from the newly formed lake a foreshadowing of a hunger that is never satisfied? There are places on earth which, like a magnet to steel, draws in things and people to a doomed ending. Sometimes there are no clues left in order to answer the question of what exactly happened. Like the Bermuda Triangle and the Black Triangle over the Great Lakes, Poyang Lake in China has earned a reputation as a place of high strangeness. It is the largest freshwater lake in the country, located in rural Jiangxi province. The area where the most ships are said to disappear is the only passage between China's largest freshwater lake and the Yangtze River, the channel at Laiyo, Lai, Laiyo, Laiya, um, I'm, I'm pronouncing this wrong, Laiyi Temple that has been an important shipping route since ancient times. In 1363, the fleets of the Ming and Han dynasties fought a bloody naval battle at Poyang Lake. This was the final days of the Mongol-led Yuan dynasty. The Ming emerged victorious and took control of the country. The leader Zhu Zhuangzang would become the first emperor of the Ming dynasty. As the decades have passed, there are sinister rumors surrounding the unexpected disappearance of ships that have never returned to port. It has earned the moniker of the waters of death or the place of death by the locals. When the Japanese occupied China, the Japanese vessel the Kobe Maru along with 200 troops inexplicably sank on April 16, 1945. It was near the Laie Temple and had set sail with favorable weather. Suddenly the weather turned and a huge wave overcame the ship and it sank. The Japanese sent in a salvage team under the command of Colonel Tomohisa. Seven divers were sent down to only 30 feet of water. Only one of them survived. The lone diver was described as being overcome with terror by something he had seen in the depths and never divulged exactly what he saw. The ship was never found, much less salvaging anything from it. With the end of the war, the Chinese government decided to try to bring up the contents of the Kobe Maru. They hired a salvage expert by the name of Edward Bolton, or Boer, to find the wreck and retrieve the contents. After a month, he could not find it, and it is said he actually lost divers in the attempt. Years later, Bolton said when he was diving with his team, there was a bright light that stabbed from the depth of the murky bottom, followed by a loud screeching sound. Then came a sense of being sucked down. It seems, though, the name Kobe Maru had its own unfavorable history. On November 30, 1924, a ship known by this name ran aground and was wrecked at Turi, an island located in the Soya Strait, which is a narrow waterway that separates the Japanese island of Hokkaido from the Russian island of Sakhalin. The ship had served in the Russo-Japanese War. But, like everything else, is the fate of the Kobe Maru really an urban myth? It's reported that on November 11, 1942, the Japanese liner, which was being used as a transport, sunk after a collision with the army cargo ship Tenzan Maru, 87 miles off the Yangtze River estuary. This event was three years before the ship was supposedly lost inside of the Loye Temple. As to the diver who supposedly went to salvage the wreck, there's only one reference to an E. Bolton in 1947, where he was reported salvaging the wreck of the Ametco, which was en route to Singapore from Sydney when she went aground. Supposedly, during a 20-year period from the 1960s to the 1980s, 200 ships vanished along with 1,600 people. On August 3, 1985, 13 ships disappeared on a single day. Survivors describe feelings of lost time and go on to suffer from mental illness. In 2001, a cargo ship was swamped by a large wave that came out of nowhere. In 2010, a 1,000-ton vessel sank on a calm day near the shore for some unexplained reason. The wreck was never found. The strangest thing underlying all these disappearances is the calm weather preceding the event and the fact that this lake has an average depth of only 28 feet, but the wrecks are not found. Where have they gone? 
Three dams were built in 1977. It is said that one dam, the closest to Laoye, Lao oh boy, what? Laoye Temple, mysteriously disappeared in just one day. Shen Daihai was sent in the 1980s with an expedition to find evidence of what occurred. When divers returned with no information, he decided to dive himself. He didn't surface, and the following day his body was found in Changba Shan Lake, which is not connected to the body of water where he disappeared from. On August 3, 1985, 13 ships went down in the same area after a sudden storm came up. Like before, recovery teams did not find any wrecks at the bottom of the lake. It seems that not a year passes without a ship going down, and efforts to salvage any contents cannot be completed. Some attribute the weird events to rogue tide waves, whirlpools, UFOs, sudden lightning storms, and even a lake monster. It's not so strange then to suspect that vortexes or portals have taken the missing ships along with their ill-fated crew. Others see the location of the lake upon the 30th degree north latitude known as God's Ring as the cause of the disasters. The area is not limited to 30 degrees latitude in the northern hemisphere, but 5 degrees upper and lower. In other words, between 25 degrees and 35 degrees north latitude. This zone crosses the ancient civilizations of Babylon, Egypt, India, and China, and 70% of ancient architectural remains are found here. The Bermuda Triangle, which is known for its history of lost ships and malfunctioning equipment, falls within this latitude. Its report of weird weather date back to Columbus's time in 1502. In 1840, a French ship named Rosalie did not reach its destination in Cuba. The vessel, which was new and built that same year, was found floating inside the Bermuda Triangle, but with no sign of the crew. Its cargo of wine, silks, and fruit were intact. Everything on board was in its proper place. She was inspected and had no leaks. Only some poultry and a cat were found alive. Other areas that fall in 30 degrees north are prone to disasters, such as earthquakes. The 1755 Lisbon earthquake had an estimated magnitude of 7.7 .7 to 9.0. Turkey is known as an earthquake, as an active earthquake zone with one recorded in 1170. In 1906, San Francisco was hit with a 7.9 magnitude quake. Wen Chuan in China was also hit with a 7.9 magnitude earthquake in 2008. In recent years, the bottom of Poyang Lake has become exposed due to extreme drop. Satellites are now able to view what was once underwater, but the wrecks of the lost ships cannot be found. Despite the passage of time and the advance of technology, there are still as many questions as ever regarding what forces claimed so many ships on Lake Poyang. So there you go. And I think that's very interesting about all these um sites and locations that are within that latitude that 10 degree latitude that it seems like you know destructive forces are at work uh next article is out of stranger than fiction stories and it's titled possessed patients and hospital demons many entities of unknown origin stock the halls of many medical facilities it's ironic that a place devoted to healing and saving lives is also a hotbed of supernatural occurrences Hospitals and nursing homes also seem to harbor a large amount of demonic entities. Most people think of haunted hospitals as abandoned buildings, but in truth, if you speak to a nurse, there's plenty of foot in a hospital while it's occupied with the living and those dying. All of them can describe eerie events. Some of them are only a feeding glance of a shadow in an empty room, and others are more malevolent. The following is an experience a nurse had with a dying patient who suffered from various illnesses which could have killed him at any moment. The patient feared death greatly and demanded the nurses keep him alive. This is the story, quote, Every time his heart monitor beeped, he would go into a rage screaming, Don't let me die! Don't let me die! We soon found out why he didn't want to die. One night, the patient took a turn for the worse, and I rushed into his room with emergency supplies. However, I wasn't prepared for what I found. This man was sitting on about two inches above the bed and was laughing. His whole look completely changed. His eyes had a look of pure evil, and he had this evil smile on his face. He laughed at us and said, You stupid bitches aren't going to let me die, are you? He ended his tirade and went into cardiac arrest, dying 20 minutes later. However, the terror was far from over. Five minutes after a doctor pronounced the patient dead, 
The newly deceased man sat up in bed and started to laugh, saying, You let him die. Too bad. What happened next sounds like something from a horror movie. We heard a horrible, agonizing scream, and then you could hear, Don't let me die, whispered throughout the unit. Every one of the nurses that night was pale and scared. Nobody went anywhere by themselves. By morning, the whispers of Don't let me die were gone. End quote. The following is another story of a patient's last moments. Quote, she was given a patient who was passing away and had been unconscious for several days. At one point during the night, the nurse went into the room and the patient was at the top of the bed and looked at her and said, don't let them take me. The nurse was freaked out and asked the patient who was going to take her. And she said, that black thing up there and pointed up in the air. His patient died within minutes, end quote. First responders are other professionals who are present with the dearly departed before they depart, and there are signs that they are not headed for the pearly gates. The paramedic's patient was highly agitated, and he seemed to dread his impending death. This is what happened. Quote, we get there, and it's this poor guy in his early 40s who is bald from chemo and sitting on his brother's couch. He just kept saying, oh, no, oh, no, and looking around the room, flinching every now and then like he was waving away flies. We got him to sit on the stretcher and he said, no, not now. The man sadly crumpled to the ground a few minutes later and died with tears on his cheeks. As we drove the man's body to the emergency room, we wondered about the patient's post-death fate. That's when things started to get weird. As I wondered if the man would go to heaven, I got a bad feeling, like darkness was creeping all around us. I happened to look down at the voltmeter and I saw the number 666 flashing. This panel normally doesn't flash at all. It just reads voltage. It went 666, then 1, then 666, then 1, then 666, then 1, and then it went back up to 1,200 or so and stayed that way. The uneasy feeling went away, but I still prayed the whole way to the hospital. For those unfamiliar with the significance of 666, many Christians associate the number with evil due to a passage in Revelation, which reads, The second beast was given power to give breath, to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. The number is 666. Do demonic entities prey on the souls of humans? Let's hope not. However, many religions teach that evil spirits are a real risk to both the faithful and disbelievers. What do you think? There you go. And I'm sure that there are, as I, I, you know, I have nurses in my family and I've heard other that, yeah, nurses uh, sometimes see a lot of weird stuff where people in the medical field around, you know, people that are dying or, Things of that nature, yeah, they, they, they've all got a few stories to tell. Okay, next story is out of Stranger Than Fiction Stories, and it's titled Mysterious um, Burials from King Arthur's Time. Several graves of British royalty dating back to the Dark Ages have been found. Originally, they were overlooked because they were not lavish enough and had no grave goods inside. Julius Caesar invaded southern Britain in 54 BC. The Romans ended their rule in 410 AD. This is when the Arthurian legend sprung. After the exodus of the Roman legions, the British continued to rule in parts of Scotland, Wales, and Western England. The Angles, Saxons, and Jutes invaded and settled in the east. In March 2022, it was reported that up to 65 graves of British kings and their families were identified in approximately 20 sites across Wales and West England. These 65 burials were found by archaeologists across England over several decades, but because of their simplicity, were not believed to be those of royalty. According to Ken Dark, professor of archaeology and history at the University of Reading, the Christian British opted for a simple burial versus the Anglo-Saxon who were pagan and buried their royalty with pomp and grave goods. The British buried their royals next to common Christians without stone inscriptions to identify them. According to Dark, he believes a real person named Arthur did exist, since the name of Arthur became popular among British and Irish royal families at the time. Only one British king who ruled during early medieval years has been unearthed in the northwest of Wales. An inscription on the gravestone identified him as Catamanus or Cadfan, 
with the word rex, which is Latin for king. However, it appears that his grave is commemorated because he became a monk. In contrast, nine graves of Anglo-Saxon kings have been found. In 1939, an Anglo-Saxon ship burial was discovered at Sutton Hoo in East England. There were about 18 burial mounds dating to the 7th century AD. They were looted centuries before. The largest mound contained an undisturbed site that contained an 89-foot ship made of oak, as well as objects of crafted from gold, garnet, and silver, including a sword and armor. There is no certainty as to who was buried there, but it's believed Raywald, who ruled East Anglia during the 7th century, is a good possibility. This type of burial was rare and reserved only for those of very high status. This was because of the manpower demanded to build a ship and drag it from the river and build a structure to encase it. The site was closed on August 25, 1939, when Britain declared war on Germany on September 3rd. According to Dark's studies, British royalty from this era were placed inside Christian cemeteries, and though they were marked as a person of importance, compared to the pagan graves, they were very plain. None were marked with inscribed stones. At Tintagel, a fortified peninsula off the coast of Cornwall, long associated with Arthur, there are thought to be five British royal graves. Inside a Christian cemetery, they are covered by a mound of earth known as Ferda, possibly because they were Irish royal graves. The British had strong ties to Celtic Ireland since they were of Celtic origin and had similar languages. Before this work, we were completely unaware of the large number of probable royal graves surviving from post-Roman Western Britain. Ongoing investigations are likely to help change our understanding of important aspects of this crucial period of British history, said Professor Dark. There is still debate as to whether King Arthur was an actual historic figure. Some theorize he was a leader named Arturus, who fought with the Celtic Britons against the Anglo-Saxons in the 5th century. However, there is no reliable historical reference for this person, but some believe this was not his name, but a title which means bear. The Saxons did overcome the Celts, but they remained strong in Cornwall, Cumberland, and Wales. It was among these people that the legend of their champion Arturus was kept alive. Bards would travel from court to court retelling the folktales of Arturus. The military leader eventually became King Arthur of England. Others believe Arthur was Dukes or Duke of Britain, which was a Roman title, but by 500 AD, King was a customary designation of a Celtic leader. Ancient records sometimes offer hints that Arthur was possibly a warrior who died in the mysterious battle of Camlan in 537 AD. His father may have been Ambrosius Aurelianus, who was a Duke of Britain. The 40 years between the reign of Ambrosius and Arthur's death were filled with struggles and shifting fortunes. The modern story of King Arthur is drawn mostly from Sir Thomas Mallory's The Death of Arthur, the Mort d'Arthur, printed in 1485. His narrative is based on the many tales told by word of mouth and then written down throughout the years. However, he based Arthur as a 15th century champion. In 2024, a hunt for Excalibur, King Arthur's sword, was initiated. The search will be part of a new TV series titled Weird Britain. In Cornwall, Da's Mary Pool, which sits on the edge of Bodmin Moor, will be searched. This is the lake which is believed to be where King Arthur received and returned Excalibur to the lady in the lake. So there you go. See, all these graves, they were, they were thinking that, of course, pagan burials, they said they had all these goods you know sometimes they even uh buried their horses and even servants slaves and everything and by comparison i guess the christianized you know leaders you know where humility and all of this was being taught that's why they were overlooked so that that i'm sure some of them are going to have to back up and look at some some places before thinking that there was nobody there of any importance anyway this time let's go to the independent and this is titled The Thousand-Year-Old Mystery of the Giant Snake Found in Drawings Across the World. Um, <clears throat> archaeologists have discovered one of the world's largest collections of ancient art showing giants and monsters walking the earth. In a remote area of South America, a British-led research team has discovered more than a thousand prehistoric engravings, including the world's largest examples of prehistoric rock, rock art. However, the archaeologists believe that the examples 
found so far are only the tip of a vast ancient artistic iceberg and that many more still await discovery. It's thought likely that the thousand square mile area, this is the size of Dorset, may well contain around 10,000 ancient engravings. The largest discovered so far is a 43 meter long engraving of a giant serpent. Others portray giant centipedes, larger than life animals, and immense 10 meter tall human-like figures. The engravings discovered along the Colombia-Venezuela border portray everything from stingrays and vultures to monkeys and crocodiles, from dogs and jaguars to turtles and frogs. There are also a large number of geometric engravings, mainly concentric circles, grid patterns, and dot-filled triangles representing as yet unidentified objects. It is one of the biggest concentrations of rock art in the world, rivaling others such as the French Dordogne region, Alpine Northern Italy, Western Australia, and South Africa in terms of volume. But by far the most unusual aspect of the engravings is the uniquely monumental nature of some of them. Around 60 of the 1,000 discovered so far have dimensions in excess of 10 meters, as well as a 43-meter serpent. They include two 10-meter tall humans-like figures, which could be spirits or gods or possibly shamans, an 11-meter long centipede, and was probably a 4-meter tall giant insect, potentially a butterfly. One field research in Colombia and Venezuela is for the very first time revealing a previously largely unknown and unrecorded ancient culture in this remote part of South America, said one of the project leaders, Dr. Philip Riris of Bournemouth University, Department of Archaeology and Anthropology. We hope that this will allow the modern world to appreciate the long lost artistic and other achievement of the people who lived here many centuries before European colonization, he added. The giant snakes, seven of them measuring between 16 and 43 meters in length, are particularly significant because they may be part of a much wider global mega serpent tradition. Academic research published by numerous scholars over the years suggests that unlike most other animal-related religious belief systems, snake worship, known to anthropologists as ophiolatry, was once a major worldwide phenomena. It featured, and in some cases still features, in religious systems and mythologies in virtually every part of the world, from prehistoric Europe and ancient Egypt to Aboriginal Australia and ancient America. Classical Greek mythology was rich in supernatural snake monsters and other snake-related beings, as was ancient Middle Eastern, European, Mexican, African, Chinese, Japanese, and Indian mythology. Serpents were often associated with the creation of humanity or of particular tribes, with immortality, and with the curing of disease. Depending on the culture, they can be regarded as benevolent or evil or as capable of being both, and were sometimes even seen as symbols of royalty. The unusually wide global distribution of snake mythology and religious iconography suggests that the phenomena is extremely ancient and that humans worldwide have for potentially Tens of thousands of years felt compelled to specifically placate and revere serpents. That is almost certainly because snakes posed and still pose a greater threat to humans than any other animal apart from disease-carrying insects. Still, today around 20,000 people die every year from venomous snake bites compared with just 100 per year from lying attacks and 500 per year from encounters with crocodiles. What's more, another 400,000 or so people are bitten and envenomed by snakes every year, even if they don't die. In ancient times, when humans lived much closer to the natural environment and continually hunted and gathered in that environment, snakes were almost certainly proportionately an even greater threat to humanity, a threat that needed to be appeased and therefore worshipped, revered, and placated. As with the newly discovered Colombian and Venezuelan examples, other ancient cultures often portrayed serpent deities or spirits as truly monumental giant creatures. In California, Ohio, Peru, and elsewhere, there are portrayals of truly gargantuan serpents writhing across local landscapes. The biggest, a vast 900-year-old, 411-meter-long earthwork representing a giant snake can still be seen on a hilltop in southern Ohio. The newly discovered Colombian engravings were made by ancient Native American people, probably between 700 and 1000 A.D., they are among the most difficult to access examples of outdoor prehistoric art in the world. That's because the prehistoric artists who engraved them often didn't 
did so high up on near vertical cliff faces. It would have been challenging, difficult, and dangerous work. The 43 meter long giant serpent, for instance, is located three quarters of the way up a 200 meter high cliff. Some evidence suggests that in ancient times it functioned as an oracle, allowing the serpent to speak to the local population through a shaman or other intermediary, much as oracles worked in the other parts of the world, including ancient Greece and ancient Egypt. The thousand engravings so far discovered by the archaeological team are located in 157 clusters along a 110-mile stretch of the Orinoco River. The first European explorers to penetrate the region were 16th century German and English treasure hunters searching for the fabled gold of El Dorado. Those adventurers, including England's Sir Walter Raleigh, never found the legendary city or the gold. But now modern explorers have succeeded in discovering an archaeological treasure trove, giant artwork that will help change the academic world's understanding of a remarkable, long-lost culture. We hope that our research work will help ensure that the extraordinary artistic heritage of the Orinoco Valley is protected and that local indigenous and mixed heritage communities will become involved in that process, said Rieris. A groundbreaking paper devoted entirely to describing the newly recorded and globally important Orinoco rock art is being published on Tuesday, etc., etc., etc. Anyway, I think that's very interesting. And I'm thinking, yeah, there, if you're going to be placing all of this, first of all, the size is like hard to overlook or on sheer cliffs. Um, yeah, you don't do that for... Yeah, that that there were probably some type of worship and things of that nature, like, and I can understand where, if you might be at the mercy of, hopefully not getting bitten by a snake, where. It's like let's make the snake god happy or some version of that. Anyway, back to stranger than fiction stories. This one's titled "Prom Queen's Murder Solved After Sixty Years." After six decades, the murder of Irene Garza, a Southern Texas beauty queen, was solved. It turned out her killer was a priest. At the end of 2017, John Bernard Fate, 85, was found guilty of murder with malice of forethought. A jury deliberated for six hours before reaching the verdict. The crime was on the killing of Irene Garza, a 25-year-old school teacher on April 14, 1960. She was a beautiful young woman who had been Miss All Texas, Miss All South Texas sweetheart in 1958, and a former prom and homecoming queen at what then was Pan American College. She was last seen leaving her home for church at 6.45 p.m. Three days later, her car was found in the parking lot of Sacred Heart Catholic Church in Edinburgh. A neighbor said the car had not been there the previous night at 9 p.m. However, there was no sign of Irene. A shoe, hat, and purse with her driver's license inside was found along McColl Road on April 19th. Two days later, her body was found floating in the 2nd Street Canal near the Sears Roebuck store. She was fully dressed, except for her shoes and underwear. Her lavender blouse had been unbuttoned. The marks on her face showed signs of a severe beating, and she had received a blow to the right side of her head. An autopsy confirmed she was dead when thrown into the canal. Since decomposition had set in, they were unable to verify if her body had been mutilated. She was raped while unconscious and died after being, from being suffocated. In 1960, John Fate, 27, was serving as interim priest at the Sacred Heart Catholic Church, and he was also Irene Garza's confessor. It was never understood why he decided to kill her on Holy Saturday. Police questioned Fate, and he told them he had heard Irene's confession in the church rectory, and not the confessional. He failed a polygraph test, and his photographic slide viewer was found near her body. Police interviewed two fellow priests who said he confessed to them about the crime, and one of them said fate had scratches on his face soon after Irene's disappearance. Two weeks before Irene Garza was killed, Maria America Guerra, 20, was sexually attacked by a man while she was kneeling at the communion rail in a church in Edinburgh. She fled after screaming and biting him on the finger. She told police the man that attacked her was Father Fate. A witness saw him run from the church after the screams. Local church leaders tried to discourage people from believing a priest was responsible for the incident. Like the attack on Maria Guerra in a nearby town, another young woman attending church accused Fate of attacking her. He pled no contest and paid a $500 fine. The Dallas Morning News interviewed Hortensia Gonzalez, 
a teenage parishioner of the church. She said, quote, we always had a warm relationship with other priests. I don't remember him as in fate, as being a warm person, end quote. She narrowly missed being killed by the priest. She had gone to confession at 5 p.m. before Irene Garza arrived. After hearing her confession, Fate said, I need to talk to you after confession, so wait for me. Instead, she slipped out a side door and ran home. Four months after Irene's murder, police came to the church to arrest Father Fate on a charge of assault with intent to rape Maria America Guerra. This is when they learned he was no longer in Texas. He was declared a fugitive, and he turned himself in a week later after he had lawyered up and said he had been recuperating in a hospital from all the stress caused by the police questioning. The trial for the assault charge ended in a mistrial of 9-3, with jurors favoring conviction. In 1962, Fate pled no contest to aggravated assault, which was a reduced charge and fined $500. His attorney said he was returning to the unnamed out-of-state hospital. In 1964, he went to the Servants of the Paraclete Religious Order New Mexico. The center opened in 1947 for the purpose of ministering to priests and brothers with personal difficulties such as pedophilia, alcohol, and substance abuse. The founder had tried to stop treating priests who were attracted to children and had homosexual tendencies, but bishops insisted he keep receiving them. He believed such priests could not be cured and could not be trusted to remain celibate and should be lay-sized even against their will. He opposed sex abusers to return to their duties as priests. The existence of this establishment was kept secret from the public, and they opened several locations throughout the world. After a series of lawsuits related to sexually abusive priests, they closed down, and present day there's only one open in Missouri. However, when John Fate went there, it was a secluded center sitting on hundreds of acres, and ironically, he went from patient to supervisor at the Servants of the Paraclete, helping child molesters return to their ministry. Why Fate was not prosecuted in, 19, in, the, in, 19, in the 1960s for Garza's murder remains a mystery. There were rumors of a deal being made between church leaders and the district attorney to stifle the investigation and avoid a scandal. The written report of examiner George Lindbergh, the polygraph examiner who asked him about both the Garza and Guerra crimes, stated that, quote, Mr. Lindbergh asked Father Fate why the lie detector chart showed that he was not telling the truth when he denied committing either of the crimes. The priest said that, contrary to his previous sworn statement to police, he had heard Miss Garza's confession in the rectory. When urged to admit guilt, Father Fate said there will never be any evidence turning up and that without a confession on his part, there is not enough evidence in either of those cases to convict him or that a good defense attorney could not tear holes in. He referred to two long unsolved murders in the area and said that the Garza case, like those, will soon be forgotten. Father Fate ultimately tried to explain his test performance by saying that a man he didn't know confessed to him that he had attacked Miss Guerra. The subject was queried as to where the confession was obtained, and he told the examiner that it was not in the confessional box, not in the rectory, but out in the open someplace, and was very vague as to where this open place was, end quote. In 1972, fate left a priesthood, married, had children, and lived in the Phoenix area. In the 1990s, he worked for the Society of St. Vincent de Paul as an administrator and spokesman, sometimes testifying before the Arizona legislature about homelessness. Irene Garza's murder case stalled and grew cold over the years, that is, until 2002, when San Antonio police received a letter from Dale Tachney. He was a former monk at the Assumption Abbey, a Trappist monastery in southwestern Missouri where fate stayed in 1963. He told him that fate confessed to placing Garza in a bathtub at the pastoral house. He had assaulted her and then bound and gagged her. Mm -hmm. Hours or days later, he moved her to another location and after some time, he placed her in a cell, cellophane bag and put her into a bathtub. As he left, he could hear her saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Tacheni wrote that he, had, that he felt fate had no remorse, but that he was haunted by the sound of Garza's heels. In 2004, Father Joseph O'Brien, who perhaps felt death breathing down his neck, he died the following year, told a Dallas Morning News reporter that fate had confessed the murder to him but omitted the victim's name, and he helped to dispose of Garza's belongings that were left in the rectory. In 2017, the new prosecutor subpoenaed records from the missionary oblates of Mary Immaculate, fate's former order, 
Included in the file was a letter from Father J. F. Paulicki to Father Lawrence J. Seidel, head of the southern region of the OMI. Dated August 1, 1960, this was just three months after Irene's body was found in the canal. He describes advice he got from the sheriff. The contents does not mention Fate's name. The contents of the letter are, quote, Father Seidel, last week I had the opportunity of speaking with the sheriff about the case. His observations are not only keen and based upon much experience in such matters, but seem to be the course we should follow. I gave the same set of observations to Bishop Riker, and he too is impressed with the sameness and the practicality of the sheriff's conclusions. After outlining to the sheriff the many facts I had received from Father Nash, the sheriff is of the opinion that the case is quite weak for the prosecution. He is also of the opinion that the prosecution must be made to see just how weak their case is, lest they go off half-cocked and set the wheels into motions that would bring this out in public print and give the opponents of the church a field day. He is also of the opinion that the case would be tried here and would not be judged on logic, but on the prejudice, prejudice prejudices of the jury. There are also political implications to this that could make this a juicy scandal for the opposition to Kennedy. And last of all, there are the Masons whom the bishop feels smell a chance to hurt the church, just as the H-E-B Baptist paid for the prosecution of the priest in East Texas who was killed by the lad he befriended. What, do all, what to do for, of all this? First, the sheriff said, that we should follow the idea of not hiring a lawyer for the reasons given by Father Nash. Second, we should not put a detective on the case hired by us, since that would mean he would be snooping around, re-questioning witnesses, and stirring up things again. However, he does feel that we should hire a person, something like a first-class private detective, who would be able to sit down with Father Nash and Father and the, and the, and the pastor of McAllen, because this happened in McAllen, Texas, to get all the information on this case, then let him write it up and present it on paper in such a way as to highlight the loopholes that are so numerous in this case. Once this is done, arrange a meeting with the police chief of McAllen, the prosecuting attorney, and the sheriff, plus four priests. At this meeting, the whole situation is brought out, and the prosecution will be able to see how strong the opposition is to their charges. They can also be brought to realize in a nice way that the church will not take this sitting down. The sheriff does not want more than the number mentioned, and he thinks that this will quiet things considerably. Once this is done, then after three or four months, or even less if possible, have this young man transferred to another part of the country as a normal obedience. He feels that everyone knows that the priests are always being transferred around, so this will not be strange. After, sometime in this new place, a year or two, then have him sent out to a foreign mission. The reason for the first move is to get him out of this area of suspicion. If something happens, the officers of the area will always be suspicious of him. The sheriff concludes that the longer time we have, the weaker the case gets. And so he suggested all this foregoing. He has much experience in such things, and I believe this is extremely wise. He, is also, he also is a Catholic, and he also stands to lose materially by such a scandal here, in such a non-Catholic area. I feel that he has rendered us an invaluable service. I submit these ideas after having consulted with Bishop Riker, was also in agreement with this course. The bishop wishes to see you, Father. At your convenience, let me know if I can do anything in the future to help this thing along. Your worries are ours since we fight the same evil one who has concocted this thing in a ceaseless fight against the church and to stop the good being done by your wonderful congregation. My prayers and my mass intentions are with you, Father, and I am sure our priests will pray hard for a special intention mentioned as much to them. Father J.F. Pauliki. There was no mention, end quote, end of that letter. There was no mention made of green guards of the victim and the agony her family was enduring. Terry McKiernan, founder of Bishop Accountability, which archives, researches, and monitors abuse within the Catholic Church, said, Some people call it the geographic solution. It was for many years the standard way for abuse allegations to be handled. Years later is when he realized the woman fate described was Irene Garza. This is the bishop that decides to come forward a year before he dies. Prior to speaking to the reporter, Hidalgo County prosecutors spoke to O'Brien and a grand jury probe found there was insufficient evidence to charge fate. The investigation into Garza's death was renewed in 2015 after a new district attorney took office in Hidalgo County. In February 2016, John Bernard Fate was arrested at his home in Scottsdale, Arizona. 
One of the lawyers who prosecuted the case in 2017 said fate was a wolf in priest's clothing. During the trial, he described that the parishioners of McAllen, especially the young women, trusted him implicitly and he took advantage of this. During the trial, one of Irene's friends, Beatrice Garcia, testified that in 1960, Father John Fate stopped her as she was walking and asked if he could take pictures for her dressed in black by the cemetery. Another friend, Anna Maria Hollingsworth, testified that Irene Garza had told her that Father Fate had previously pulled her out of the church confessional and had insisted she give her confession in the rectory, which in those days was highly unusual. Neither of Irene's parents lived to see the resolution of the case since they both died in the 1990s. The prosecution asked for a sentence of 57 years, but the jury decided on a sentence of life in prison. He was incarcerated until his death on February 12, 2020. Fate's, brothers, Fate's brother, Matthias Albert Fate, also took holy orders and served as a priest for 60 years. In 2007, while the cold case of Irene Garza was on a slow simmer, Father Richard Junius was murdered. He was 76 years old and a month shy of celebrating 50 years as a priest. What is his connection to the Garza murder case? Back in 1960, Father Junius was the other priest at Sacred Heart Catholic Church and was the original person Irene Garza meant to confess to when instead she crossed paths with John Fate. In the years after leaving Sacred Heart, Father Richard was sent to Mexico and at the time of his death was serving at Our Lady of Guadalupe Church in Mexico City. A fire broke out in the basement of the church on the night of July 29, 2007, and he was found in the morning, stripped, tortured, bound hand and foot, and strangled. There were porn magazines found at the scene. Mexican news reports insinuate he died as a result of sexual misconduct, but didn't mention the fire and that several items were stolen from the church. It was reported in the Catholic news agency that church officials in Mexico, thousands of faithful, and the congregation of the missionary oblates of Mary Immaculate, have strongly condemned the media coverage of the death of American missionary Father Richard Junius Sander, who was killed on July 29th for denouncing a nearby popular club frequented by young people. It's believed the true reason Father Richard was murdered was because he called out a neighborhood bar for serving liquor to minors. This might have impeded other illegal activities taking place, including drug trafficking. Considering the country is run by drug cartels, it's not far-fetched, that a well-loved parish priest would be killed and his death seen staged to ruin his reputation and smear his legacy. No investigation was made of the crime and it remains unsolved. In 2016, Mexico was cited as the most dangerous country in the world for the clergy for the eighth time in a row. There were two persons who ironically were devout and undeserving of the violent deaths they were destined for. These two persons, of course, are Irene Garza and Father Junius. And... You know, I, when you read this part of the letter about that we, we oppose the evil one, I don't know who's worse, the sheriff who's giving them all these ideas, the priests that are going forward with this, and this other priest who says he heard the confession, but he didn't know that it's uh, that who he was talking about was Irene Garza. Who, who cares? You have a priest confess to you that he's done this? Really? The name is almost, it doesn't matter what her name is. I don't know exactly what canon law requires as far as this type of confession. But, and and of course, he was shuffled around and, and I guess, well, he got out in 1972 and he got married or whatever. But it, it's, it's incredible. See, these are the kind of things. And of course, he... I don't think he even made it to three years in jail, you know. And uh, it's incredible how much of a cover-up. In other words, he committed the crime, but the cover-up by those in power because of for their own whatever, personal, political, whatever, it, it is incredible when you, when you read stories like that. But at least he was, at the end, you know, he was exposed. He was exposed. It would have been... Worse if it wouldn't have happened that way. Okay, and then also out of Stranger Than Fiction stories, <clears throat> excuse me, is a house with a history of murder. The house was built in 1918, 100 years after the establishment of Uniontown, Alabama. 
It's derelict and crumbling now, built in the neoclassical revival style with its fluted ionic columns. It's not difficult to imagine how splendid it once looked. Even now, it seems the perfect setting for a southern Gothic mystery. Originally known as the Hardy Coleman House, it's death that's made it notorious as the Alan Lucy Murder House. In September 1985, local newspapers ran stories of a missing 14-year-old named Alan Lucy, who, appe- who disappeared on May 21st after he left for school. His mother described the intervening months as agony. According to his father, Philip Lucy, a Union Town boy said he saw a tall, heavy-set white man with a short black beard and mustache take Alan by the neck and lead him away. Alan was in front of the Piggly Wiggly. The youth said the man marched Alan right by him, but Alan walked by like he didn't even know him. The police refused to consider it anything but a case of a runaway teenager, since the Lucys also gave them contradictory information. They feared he was kidnapped, but also said that Alan was being difficult and they feared he had run away to Florida to join friends. The Lucys distributed flyers throughout town with Alan's picture and gave his information to the missing children's bureau that served their area. Alan was one of seven children. The older children lived out of state, so besides Alan, there was a 13-year-old and an 8-year-old at home. To all appearances, the Lucys appeared to be devastated parents who believed their son had not run away but had been kidnapped by a stranger. They even offered a reward for any information about him. It seems they felt sure no one would claim it since Alan was neither a runaway or had been kidnapped. Instead, he was dead and had been buried under the front porch of the house. In 1994, nine years after Alan's disappearance, skeletal remains were found in a cross space under a front porch column. It was buried under less than a foot of dirt and been wrapped in a Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck bed sheet and covered with two plastic bags. The Lucys had sold the house three months before and the new owners were digging in the crawl space when they came upon it. According to District Attorney Roy Johnson, the skull was split under an eye socket, but we're not sure what may have caused that. The police found the parents who had moved to Lamison, but Philip and Dale Lucy refused to come to the police station and answer any questions. The couple had taken Alan in as a foster child when they lived in Florida, and he was eight years old. When he was 11, they adopted him. Then the Lucys were arrested and charged with arson, in an unrelated investigation into a house fire dating back to 1989. They had tried to collect on part of a $119,000 insurance policy taken out only a month before. Further investigation found they had filed claims on two other houses that were damaged by fire. First in 1965 for a St. Louis house, then in 1976 for a home in Baskin, Louisiana. A report issued by the state fire marshal said the Lucy family was seen standing outside their Union Town house after the fire started, fully dressed and making no attempt to put it out. Mr. Bauman, who was one of the new owners, recalled that he once sat on the front porch with Philip Lucy and that he enjoyed rocking on, at one corner of the porch, just above where Alan's remains would eventually be found, Bauman said. He kept saying that he felt the presence of ghosts where he liked to rock away. Authorities then brought a corpse-sniffing dog who indicated that a body was or had been in the backyard of the house. An earth-moving vehicle was brought to the home, but no more bodies were discovered. Uniontown Police Chief Robert Hester said there were reports the house may have been constructed over a cemetery. Two days later, examination of the remains confirmed they belonged to Alan Lucy by a comparison of dental records. In the midst of the investigation, a self-proclaimed psychic from Marion showed up at the murder scene and said that he had a vision of a little girl's body buried in the backyard. Kelly Kirby, the new owner, said the psychic told him he dreamed that a five-year-old girl was buried near an evergreen tree. She had long dark hair and had been interred 12 feet from this tree. Kirby paced off the 12 feet and dug down about a foot and found only some bricks. There were no missing persons reports for a five-year-old. Then police then sought out Phyllis Tink Lucy Bowler, a teacher at Auburn University who was Alan's stepsister. They asked her about the boy's disappearance. She said she had no knowledge about what happened to him. She had married and left home a year after Alan Lucy vanished. The new owner of the home turned around and sued the Lucys for $1.9 million for not telling them about the body. He said nobody will want to rent a room from me at this location. Fast forward a year, and Philip Lucy was charged with killing Alan Lucy 
and Mrs. Lucy was out on bond for the charge of arson. Jason, the Lucy's natural son, testified his father's he, that he saw his father strike Alan in the kitchen of the house. Alan had fallen to the floor and didn't move. His eyes were half open. Then a few hours later, he saw his father carrying a shovel and some dirty clothes out in the backyard. <laughs> Investigators believed Philip Lucy buried the body first in the yard and then unearthed it a year later and moved it under the porch. Authorities found that Alan Lucy died as a result of blunt force trauma to the neck and that Philip Lucy inflicted the blows with his fist. Since Philip Lucy was a former boxer, it was not hard to believe he could kill a teenager with one blow, or perhaps in a darker version, version he buried Alan while he was still alive. Eventually, Philip was found competent to stand trial for the beating death of his adopted son. However, within a few weeks, it was reversed when he was found mentally incompetent to stand trial. He was once more ordered to go in for psychiatric examination. Dale Lucy then testified that her husband vowed to kill her if she spoke out against him. She said that he physically abused her in the past once breaking one of her fingers after she pointed it at him. Dale and her son Jason were charged the year before with mistreating an incapacitated adult, Donald Lucy, an adopted son who was mentally retarded. By March 1994, the Lucys had been indicted for arson and Philip Lucy was sent to be mentally evaluated again after it was found he hid the fact that he had serious mental problems. Philip Lucy, 61, and his wife, Margaret Dale Lucy, 47, both pled innocent to the arson charges. It seemed that Mr. Lucy had been receiving disability benefits since 1977 for a back injury, but in 1979, his benefits were being paid to him because he was afflicted with a paranoid-type schizophrenia. Philip had a history of violence, having been dishonorably discharged from the army for beating a soldier during the Korean War. It was not until 1997 that Philip Lucy was found competent to stand trial. In 1998, while he was awaiting his day in court, Philip Lucy said the skeletal remains were taken from a cemetery as a Halloween prank and they did not belong to his adopted son. This was despite the fact that forensic examiners had matched the teeth from the remains to dental records for Allen and later DNA taken from his biological mother confi confirmed the same. The trial was delayed in 1998 because the district attorney was having a problem locating Jason Lucy for testimony at the trial. Soon after the discovery of Allen's remains in 1994, he disappeared. A transcript taken during the preliminary hearing was used. In 1999, Philip Lucy was released on $10,000 bond from the Perry County Jail where he had been kept for the last five years. However, the citizens in the neighborhood signed a petition presented to the Perry County District Attorney that they wanted him removed from the area because they feared for the safety of their children. Lucy was found guilty of murder and sentenced to 25 years in prison. However, in 2000, he was given another trial because of problems with a jury pick. In 2001, during the second trial, Roy Johnson, the district attorney who prosecuted Lucy initially, had died. So had Lucy's wife who divorced him following his arrest. Luckily, Jason Lucy, who had not been available to testify against his father, was found in Missouri and held on a probation violation. On November 29, 2001, Philip Lucy was found hanging in his Perry County jail cell 12 hours after a jury found him guilty of beating his adopted son to death. He fashioned a noose from bed sheets. Lucy had already suffered two strokes previous to the trial. Ardella Leisure, who was Alan's biological mother, confronted Lucy after his conviction and told him from the witness stand, I hope you die in prison. She and her second husband, Robert Leisure, attended both trials. They had been married for 23 years. Alan Lucy was born William Allen Marvel to Willard D. Marvel and Ardella May Narragon in Lee County, Florida. His mother said the state took her son because of a dispute she was having with her ex-husband and she never saw him again. She said the state of Florida took him into custody and placed him for adoption. Ardella Leisure said she ran into problems from a lawyer who cared more about money than the child and a judge with a reputation for making controversial decisions about child custody. The attorney said it would take more money to fight the judge. She didn't know of Alan's disappearance until Philip Lucy was scheduled for trial and her son's death. Until 2001, Alan had remained unburied for seven years. Funds were raised by the county and he was laid to rest on January 30, 2002 at the Rosemont Cemetery in Uniontown, Alabama. As of 2022, the Hardy Coleman House 
is owned by Alamdorf Air, ba- Air Force Base in Alaska and co-owned by the Raytheon Cobra Dane Project, although it's unknown as to why a military radar installation in Alaska would own an abandoned house in a small town in Alabama. Interesting, huh? And you ask yourself, why were the men with obvious mental problems who was receiving benefits for schizophrenia allowed to adopt these children and the fostering? It's like, you look at these things, and in other words, I guess what I'm saying is, this is not a secret. If you're receiving benefits from a mental disability, it's this is not like somebody was crazy, but it wasn't, it was, how's this, not, it was not official. But there you go. There you go. And of course, he did away with himself, which, oh well. But again, makes you wonder if he abused any of his other children. Well, and we've come to the end of this trip into Erie Newsland, but I will be back soon with some more. And until next time, take care.